And that's because that is precisely what I told Connie to type. <laughs> because my brain was not in tune with the other half of my brain. And I'm busy writing a sermon on Micah chapter 2. And in all my notes, I had Micah chapter 3. So the brain is a funny thing, is it not? So we are going to be, the words are going to be on the screen, uh, the correct words. And uh, just be gracious and bear with me and uh, disregard the, you can use the space in the bulletin to write your sermon notes, but that's not the proper text. Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 is the proper text. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank You for this day. And Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we ask that You bless it to us. Lord, may the reading of Your Word reach our hearts and minds. And Lord, may the preaching of it also do that. And Lord, we confess that eyes that see and ears that hear, the Lord God has made them both. And so, Lord, make those eyes and ears in each of us, we pray. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, Against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks. And you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you, and moan bitterly, and say, We are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, that's a very sobering, sobering oracle from an ancient prophet. And a lot of it might get lost on us. So we're going to take a running start at it. And then we're going to take a deep dive into exactly what he's saying. Or Micah has a very, very long ministry. In Micah chapter 1, we're told that he prophesied in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So his ministry, if you go back to 2 Kings and look at the length of reigns of those men, he could have been uh, had a, a, a prophetic ministry. His preaching ministry could have spanned 40 years. And he'd seen a lot in the 8th century B.C. The 8th century B.C. was a time of burgeoning economic health in both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. It was a time when there was relative stability, and there was, it was a time when there was a lot of trade happening. And a lot of that trade went through Samaria and through Jerusalem. And so people were making money, and a lot of it. But that wasn't really the problem, even though this text in Micah chapter 2 is going to talk about that. The problem, as it's described in the second half of Micah chapter 1, is that the people and their whole culture was built on the foundation of pagan idolatry. God was not at the center of their national consciousness and their spiritual life. In fact, other gods were. All of the benefits of the society they built were likened three times in verse 7 to the wages of a prostitute. And to a wage of a prostitute all of their accomplishments would return. When the Babylonians and with the northern tribes, the Assyrians, came and smashed up all of their beautiful gold and brass and ivory and silver ornaments and paid for prostitutes with them. So God witnesses first against His people because they have built their life on a foundation other than Himself. They have flown to the bales and the Asherah poles that run every high hill and under every spreading tree. And when he comes to chapter 2, he specifically talks about some of the fruit that that broken, diseased spiritual root produced. You see, the problem lies in the heart of man. We're going to even see that in Micah chapter 2, verse 1. But the result of it is so often 
and the works and the effects that we have on others. So look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. Woe to those who devise wickedness, or alas. And this is a very ironic statement. That word alas is not just simply the preface to a, a woe oracle. This is a, a, a funerary form where he's like declaring, although they're still alive, that, oh, they're dead and gone. Let's grieve them now. In fact, that theme is going to be picked up in this taunt song we'll get to in a moment. But what happens in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, is God is taking aim at one of the predominant fruits of a godless society, and He is assigning to it its just reward. They have been absolutely concerned on doing everything they could to increase their inheritance on this side of heaven, with the result that they will have zero inheritance in the true heaven. They have done everything they could to amass huge fortunes and massive acreages here. Well, in the world to come, they will have absolutely nothing. And this brief five-verse oracle of Micah's focuses in on three features of the sinfulness of a pagan world that are very humbling. And the first is that when we build a foundation on anything other than the living God, our sins become shameless. Shameless. I remember when I was an intern in 1996 at a church in Rochester, there was a cable, this is before, in 1996, the, the internet I think was still a baby. I didn't even have a, an email address at that point. But everyone still had cable TV, and there was a local cable, public cable TV station in Rochester, New York, called Life Without Shame. And it was nasty. Tried to watch it once. Awful. I want you to think about our world today. How the things that we... Th there was a time when the things done in public would not have even been whispered in the dark. And now it's as if we boast about things that would be better left never spoken. And I want you to look at this description. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it. That's the opposite, even of the ancient culture. In the ancient culture, and this is what I learned preparing this sermon, courts met at the break of day. Courts met at dawn. Because that's the time when everything comes to light. Throughout even your Old Testaments, the night time is the time crimes are committed. The criminals come up with their plots during the day and they wait to the darkness to hide their deeds. But not these folks. Woe to them. At night time, they're coming up with their plan and they're executing their plans in broad daylight. If you build your life on a foundation of other than the living God, sooner or later, sooner or later, you will have left shame and conscientiousness behind you, and you will live your life however you want under the bright burning noonday sun with utter disregard for the law of God. There's no such thing as an idle, benign indifference to the living God. We will either follow Him and grow in our relationship with Him and reflection of Him, or we will find ourselves declining further and further and further into a settled antipathy and opposition to who He is and what His law requires. And it's a brutal kind of shamelessness. It's a shamelessness that does whatever its power enables it to do. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. So if we could go back in a time capsule to 800 B.C., this would strike us as awful. This is the exact reversal of what we would want to see. When the morning dawns, that's when justice should be announced, when the court meets. But instead, it's when those who have the power to execute their will regardless of right and wrong, heaven or hell. Dawn has become when people do whatever they're able to, however they want to, whenever they want to. 
And that's a description of a dreadful society. Not one that I would care to live in. The shamelessness of this situation is matched by another word very cleverly chosen. Oh yes, insensitivity. <laughs> insensitivity. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man and his inheritance. This is personal. They could not care less for the health or the wealth or the contentedness of their neighbor whose land or fields they've taken a liking to. They have an absolute disregard for the person who's being deprived of justice, being evicted from their land in a place of suffering. They simply don't care. And this is de definitely, this whole passage, as you'll see, is really plays on the great theme of land. And land was important uh, in ancient Israel, just as it is today. The blessings of God experienced on this side of, the, uh, of heaven were often described as uh, land, seed, and blessing. A place to live, a family to, to live with, and a relationship with God by which to enjoy it all. And here, this idea of an inheritance, what God has given. And remember, God gave everyone in His covenant people an inheritance. Lots were cast. Boundary lines were drawn. And people were given, according to clans and tribes and, fa tribes and clans and families, specific parcels of land that were every 50 years to revert back to them if some disaster had befallen and they had lost the ability or the, 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 well, the ability to, to farm it or to tend it or to raise a herd or a crop or a vineyard. <laughs> but here we have people with power breaking the Tenth Commandment, coveting fields, and seizing them. Broad daylight. Broad daylight. And they are not caring about the man in his house, the man in his inheritance, but rather oppressing them. <laughs> You know, it's a very difficult and dangerous thing for a preacher to think he knows what's going on in the world of today because it's very hard to know. Uh, it's very hard to get uh, uncurated, untampered with news feeds. You all know what I'm talking about. But I have seen some very, uh, to use the word in its old-fashioned original sense, pathetic, uh, deeply emotional, troubling reports coming out of Hawaii where you have people who's, and over a hundred people lost their lives, thousands of people lost their homes, and faster than people can line up resources to help shelter and feed and rebuild, people are moving in trying to offer deals to get the land from those folks. And some of these folks are in a position evidently where they can't say no. They're kind of waiting for different kinds of help to kick in. And so now, people are amassing large tracts of land, evidently, in Hawaii. And one asks, is it with regard for the person that lived there? Or are they benefiting from another person's tragedy? And that's a fine line. And I don't want to say for a second that real estate developers or landholders or, uh, or uh, landlords are in any way de facto sinning. And that needs to be said. It needs to be said that some people are very rich and some people are very poor and there is nothing sinful in and of those facts themselves. Must be said. And it also must be said that Micah chapter 2 and as we get to Micah chapter 3 are not just a kind of carte blanche blanket exoneration of the poor. In fact, this isn't really about the poor in chapter 2. It's about landowners. It's about small farmers. It's about men and women who had families and had their own flocks and herds on them, who are finding themselves the object of a greedy eye's attention and having corrupt laws manipulated against them to force them off the land and it is a matter of historical record that in the 8th century B.C., 
throughout this part of the ancient Near East, you had larger and larger and larger land holdings. It's, some people kind of anachronistically, anachronistically call it the rise of land barons. With no regard for the fact that they are translating what would have in the Middle Ages been called a yeoman farmer into a serf, a peasant, a slave of the land. And this idea that people with power and legal connections can see a land, see a property, and simply take it and crowd the others out is what Micah is decrying as fruit of a godless culture. A godless culture that is utterly focused on the here and now, the tangible. They're more concerned with the dirt of this earth than the paving stones of heaven. They're interested in mud, not gold. And here the Lord says to them, because of their shamelessness, their execution of the night's plans in broad daylight because of their insensity, insensitivity, the fact that they don't care about the people, that their constant lust for more is uh, leaving with less. He highlights the ridiculous, incredulous nature of the offenders. Therefore, says the Lord in verse 3, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster. Notice he's making it personal. These landholders that were constantly grabbing more, they didn't care about the families of others. Well, the Lord's going to give them a just return on their interest. This family will have a divinely devised disaster brought against it from which they cannot remove their necks. They will not walk haughtily for it will be a time of disaster. A time when a taunt song will be taken up against you. And people will moan bitterly. And that's very ironic. And what is the taunt song? Listen to this. They're going to sing. The people who have been dispossessed from the land. They are going to sing, We are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people. How he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Think about that. These people who took the land from God's people are going to be dispossessed by the Babylonians. They are going to be forced to live on squalid little plots at the bank of a canal outside of Babylon. And at that point, they're going to say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people. Well, that's exactly what you had been doing. You had been ruining people and changing their portion. You had been depriving them of their homesteads. And He removes it from me. To an apostate, he allots our fields. He's given our fields to Babylonians and he took it away from me. Well, you took it away from other people and you worship the same gods they do. <laughs> You've got your Asher pole, pole and your Baal idol right in your backyard. There's a sense in which this song, as bitter and vindictive as it is, as a taunt coming from those who have already been dispossessed, is saying to them, look, you are now experiencing to the nth degree, precisely what you made all of us experience all along. There is a justice to the deserts that God hands out at the end of the day. But the painful note here, friends, comes in verse 5. Because of your shamelessness, because of your insensitivity, because of the fact that you were oblivious to the fact that you would be heartbroken, if someone did to you what you've done to others and your incredulous response to the chastisements of a just God, you are going to be left out completely of the final settling of God's covenant promises. You are going to have no place in heaven. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. And this cannot be interpreted but by looking forward with what theologians call an eschatological perspective. Eschatology meaning the end times or a word of the study of the last. And here we have this clear picture of God saying to them, therefore, when the inheritance is redistributed once for all, you will have no one, no one to cast the boundary line by law. No one 
you are going to be left out and no longer a part of the assembly of the Lord. This is a sobering thought for us. We're going to go back to the view from, we, we took a running start, we did a deep dive, now we're going to 40,000 feet. A life lived with something other than the living God at its heart, as its foundation, as its guiding principle, is a life that sooner or later focuses on yourself as opposed to God. In dealing with the idea of land and relationships and law, many years ago, many centuries ago, St. Augustine wrote a classic of Western literature called City of God. Anybody heard of it? We had a young man who attended this church for some while, grew up in a secular Jewish family in Oak Park, went to Oak Park High School, and he went back east to was it Fordham University, Carrie? Oh, he's not even here. <laughs> yeah, Carrie's homesick. And as a reading assignment, he was given City of God for a political science course. And he ended up coming to Christ. Wow. The City of God by St. Augustine, one of the foundational texts of Western literature. And in that, Augustine proposes that there are two cities. The City of God and the City of Man. In the city of man, you disregard God and end up focusing on yourself at God's expense. In the city of God, he offers a powerful and a convicting thesis. In the city of God, you focus on God even at your own expense. And in the city of God, you live your life with God as the both the warp and the woof of your existence, the both vertical and horizontal axes on your graph. God is the one in whom you live and move and have your being. His words are your marching orders. His gospel is your hope. And when you live your life that way, you cease to be concerned merely with your own bottom line. And you begin to be concerned with how can I live my life in a manner that reflects and shows the grace and love that's been given me to another person. Such that when you see a piece of land you really like, and you know that, aha, there's a corner on the law here where I could do this and that, and I could get that land for myself, rather, you are going to find yourself saying, the Lord has given me enough. If I do this, I can ensure that that person can stay on their land. That is the photo negative to the crime and sin described in Amos chapter 2. And that is not to say that it is never okay to buy a second house. It's not being said at all here. Because there are many ways to buy a second house in which you are not oppressing a man in his house or a man in his inheritance. But oh, those of you who know the real estate market and know the way the world works today, know that there are also many other ways of getting a second house, or a third, or a fifth, or a tenth. And there are a lot of ways of taking advantage of people. And without offering any blanket condemnation of lawyers, of whom we have several in training here, there are many unscrupulous pastors, and teachers, and doctors, and lawyers who are particularly keen on helping people find loopholes and ways to push people off of land that larger holdings can be had by fewer with no regard for the suffering of the little person. And Christian, this text, if nothing else, must call us to be sensitive with that in our own life. Micah nowhere calls people to rebellion. He nowhere calls them to revolution. He nowhere calls them to kind of be anarchists and tear down property lines and redistribute. He's not a Marxist who preaches on fury and retribution. He is, let's call him a proto-gospel preacher who is pointing people to heaven. And he's inviting us to think of the fact that we are emissaries and agents of a heavenly ethic here and now. And we are able to not experience this woeful, dreadful, uh, ironically tragic but utterly just dissolution of our souls in the pursuit of real estate and wealth now.
We can care about other people, even at our own expense, rather than seeing other people suffering as an opportunity for us to get a great deal. And that's an important thing for us to do, because that's the way Christ lived His life. Christ lived His life concerned more for His effect on you than He was for your effect on Him. Think about that. Jesus selflessly gave of Himself over and over and over again to people who never reciprocated. When He healed ten lepers, only one came back and said thank you. But He kept healing lepers. When people came to talk to Him, whether it was Nicodemus in the middle of the night or scribes and teachers of the law in broad daylight, just because He got rejected once, twice, four times, He kept talking to people. Just because one town rejected Him, doesn't mean He stopped going to towns. He kept going to towns, and some of them more than once. When we think about the life of Christ, we think of a life lived in which He is absolutely concerned not with getting your property, but with giving you His property. You see, Jesus Christ came and He never had a home. But His entire life was lived so that you might have one forever. And He invites us, not necessarily to follow in some slavish imitation and all sell our homes and be homeless. That is the furthest thing from Scripture. Your home is a blessing from God. Cherish it. Love it. Take pride of ownership in it. See yourself as a steward appointed by God to take care of it. And if there are multiple homes that you own, amen and yes, the same thing is true. But care deeply about other people because they're created in the image of the living God. And they have their inheritance in their family. Care deeply. Act justly. Love mercy and walk humbly. We're going to get to that in a couple chapters. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has called us to live a life with Himself, the living God, at the dead center of it and the bedrock foundation. Worship Him and Him alone. And you'll find that the imaginations of your heart and mind at nighttime will start to trend in a more blessed direction. And the activities you're willing to perform under the sun are far more honorable. Almighty God, we ask that You bless us. Lord, we pray that You would help us to flee from the corruption of the world. Lord, we live in a world that is completely addicted to the here and the now, to the size of our state and the depth of our account. And Father, we pray that You would help us to on the one hand be wise stewards of those things, but recognize that that treasure that is kept there can be eaten by moths, it can be stolen, it can be destroyed. But Lord, when we invest our treasures in heaven, they can never be taken and they are certain and sure forever. Lord, help us to be heavenly minded. Lord, help us to long to make investments in our life in the world to come and live in society here and now in a manner that reflects that. And Father, we pray above all that You would be adding to Your number those who get out of this rat race and join the sheep herd in following Christ the Savior. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.